All right, I'm I'm just ecstatic about today. Um, Sunday after Easter, I, I got to wear my Easter shirt today because I didn't get to wear it last week because it was too cold, but today it wasn't. But one of the things that comes along with that spring warm is the spring pollen. And I don't know about you guys, but I've, man, I'm struggling. Um, I've got half my nose that's get coming out and just all kinds of like, whoo, Arkansas allergies are a big deal, so... Um, y'all pray for me this morning that I, my voice hangs out and that, uh, that I don't have to blow my head off or anything like that. That's just part of it, right? Anybody else feeling what I'm feeling right now? Okay, good, good. Um, well, man, we're glad that you're here, no matter whether you're feeling great or fe- whether you're feeling awesome or whether you feel like you're talking in a barrel. Um, I can't hardly hear myself this morning. So this is going to be fun, though. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to kick it off today back into Ephesians, and uh, man, I am, I'm really looking forward to, to today. Uh, y'all are in for a treat. I've taken two sermons, I've taken one sermon, I've turned it into two. So, that's a good thing, by the way, because the one was going to be, I think, too long. So, uh, we're going we're gonna to tackle about half of what I had planned today, uh, but it, man, it's going to be so good. I'm telling you what, my heart just, just jumped a little bit. I looked up in the balcony, and, and, and the Murrays, Don and Mary Murray are here today. Praise the Lord. Man, we are so glad to see you guys. And, uh, and, and do us a big favor by not shaking a whole bunch of hands or anything like that. So um, just, just, man, we're glad that you guys are here. And, uh, and I know that y'all have been faithfully watching and uh, praying for us, and, and we're just glad, glad that you guys are here today. Uh, if you are a guest with us today... Man, I would love for you to take one of these uh, purple cards that's in your seat back and just fill out the information on that. And then at, after the service is over, I'm going to be sneaking out to the front steps. I've tried every possible way to greet people after church and, and uh, get to know some of our guests and stuff like that. So I'm going to try the steps this time. Does that sound good? So if, you, if you're here with us for the first time, I would love for you just to bring this purple card to me. I've got a gift for you. Uh, just to thank you for being here today. Thank you for worshiping with us. And, uh, man, it's going to be a fun, fun day. Uh, so let's, let's go ahead and start it off with prayer, and then we'll get to worship. Lord, thank you so much for today. Uh, thank you that once again we get to come on a Sunday and celebrate the resurrection. Uh, Lord, that for the believer in Christ, uh, every Sunday is a remembrance, is a reminder that you are alive and that we serve a living God. So, Lord, I pray that today your spirit uh, would be free to move in our hearts, to work in our lives, Lord. Uh, I pray that you, would, that you would do work uh, in us today. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for meeting with us today, Lord. I pray that you would be honored, praised, and lifted high, Lord, because you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. Yeah. 
you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay in my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my turn to the New Testament book of Ephesians. So uh, it'll be right after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, keep wandering through Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and then you will get to this six-chapter letter 
that Paul wrote from prison to a group of people who were Christ's followers in, in Ephesus. Uh, so Paul is ex- expecting that this letter to these folks was going to be read not only to one church, but to all of the churches at Ephesus. And that was kind of the plan for a lot of the New Testament writings to the churches, is that they would be shared around. Because you got to remember, as we get to this point in history, Jesus has lived, he has died, he has risen again, and now we have come into the age of the early church. These Christ followers are getting together. Uh, They don't have big cathedrals. They don't have stained glass windows. They're meeting in people's homes. It's small outcroppings of pods of people that are getting together, and they're worshiping Jesus. Uh, So this is uh, the early part. They don't have the benefit and the blessing that we do today of having a completed New Testament, a completed canon. So uh, all this stuff they're kind of learning on the fly. So whenever they get together, what are they doing? Well, they're, they're... Looking at the apostles' teachings, they are still looking at the Old Testament, all the things that the Old Testament says about Jesus that they're looking at uh, and his fulfillment of that. They're worshiping God for a changed life. So when we get to Ephesus in the letter to the Ephesians, essentially what we've got is a book that is separated into two parts. So the first part is the first three chapters, and that basically tells us why we believe, how we believe, what God has done in Christ, which is more than we could ever have imagined that God would do for us. And then we get to the second half, and, uh, and we, we see that it, it kind of transitions from just what to believe, but this is how we live that out. So you, you might, transla- might kind of term it how, how we believe and how we behave, but I think that's a there's a better way to determine that. I think there's a better way to say that. It's, it's how we believe and then what we become, okay? Um, and so this is where we are in, in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start looking at what we become because of what we have believed in Christ, and it is more than you can imagine. Now, becoming who God made you to be, it doesn't happen in an instant, and it doesn't happen without intention. So there, there are two things that we have to remember there, that it doesn't, have, it doesn't happen in an instant. Like it's not just I pray and I ask Jesus to save me, and all of a sudden, boom. Split the shirt open, I've got an S on my chest, right? Like that's not how, that's not how it works. Or a big C for Christian. Like, and, and everything's good, and I know how to... No, 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 no. It means that there's a change of heart, but it, do, it doesn't mean that we're all just like, okay, boom, done. That we, that we quit working or that we quit trying or we quit intentionally seeking Christ, okay? The same gospel and the same good news that saved us is the same gospel that sustains us for the rest of our life. It's the same gospel that sanctifies us. Sanctification just means becoming more like Jesus. So when we get here, we get to the, this section of the letter where Paul's really going to turn to the practical outworking of the faith that Christ has worked in them. Now, this is really the key difference in Christianity and every other major world religion. Is Christianity, we have sinful people who are forgiven from sin and made right with God through faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross that allows us to work from the power that now lives in us. And every other world religion is we have sinful people who are working in their own power trying to earn favor with a God or gods who sit back rooting for them to fail. And it's just, it's a completely different aspect. So as we get to Ephesians chapter 4, we see, we see unity. We see peace. We see a lot of things that we're going to become. So let's pray and then we'll read. Lord, we thank you today for, for all that you are for all that you've done, for all that you're going to do. Lord, I pray that as we read these scriptures, Lord, that that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to change, Lord, to become who you've made us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says this, I, therefore, and remember, whenever you see the word therefore in scripture, what do you need to do? You need to check and see what it's there for. 
All right, therefore is always a linking word, and it's going to link everything that Paul has just said to what he's about to say. Okay, so he says, I therefore, the therefore means all the stuff that I just said about being in Christ, all the work of Christ on the cross through faith, by grace, not of yourselves, not of works, so that nobody can boast, nobody can brag about it. It's all about Jesus. Because of that, he says, I am a prisoner for the Lord. He said, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I tell you what, let's stop right there. I think that is about as far as we're going to get today. I, I had planned on working all the way through verse 6, but I just can't do it. Uh, not in one sitting. So it's like, uh, it's like getting a big old plate full of food over at Reed's. You know, like you, you think you might be able to get all through it, but then at the end of the night, you're like, no, nah, I'm going to need to go box. All right? And so this is, uh, we're going we're gonna to get it to go box for next week too. So the first three verses, um, uh, let me just, let me just kind of hit some of the high points that Paul says to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called. He talks about humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit, the bond of peace. Um, whoo, that's a whole lot, right? And as we, as we read sections like this, we have to be very careful that we don't read this as a to-do list. All right, as as we, because what we could do very easily is say, all right, walk worthy of the calling which you've been called. Check, humility. All right, I check gentleness. Check, I did that once. Uh, patience. Check, unless I'm driving. Um, <laughs> bearing with one another in love. Uh, check, okay, kind of check. Uh, and and we can we can see this as a as a to do list, and that's not at all what Paul is is trying to say. What this is, is not a to-do list, but it's, it's a to-be list, to become list. This is what we are. This is who God has made us to be in Christ. It's, it's, not, a, uh, it's not a be better kind of, kind of thought process either. A lot of people will come to religion to better themselves, right? So I'm going to pray because it's going to make me a better person, or I'm going to come to church because it's going to make me a better person person or it's going to help me with one or the other of these things that are deficient in my life. When in actuality, everything in our lives is deficient without Christ. We don't have anything on our own that's worthy to be praised. In my heart dwells no good thing, but Christ dwells in my heart and Christ is a good thing. That's, that's the old man, the new man. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of theme everything today off of, off of steps. So uh, the, the, we're going to have four points today, and I'm going to give them to you up front. So uh, the first one is to step up. second one is to step back. The third one is to step slowly. And the fourth one is to step around. Okay, so step up. What do you mean by that? Well, Paul says to, to walk worthy. Uh, to lead a worthy life. Well, what does that mean? Because he's urging them, right? Because these, remember, these are new believers. These are, these are first-generation Christians that he's writing to that are trying to figure out how to live. They're trying to figure out what takes place, what am I supposed to do. And, and Paul, is, uh, Paul is writing to them at a time where there's been enough time that's passed that some of them are reverting to old practices, they're reverting back to the old way of life that they used to live. They're, they're doing some of the things that they did before they were saved. Okay, so Paul's writing to these guys to try to, to try to encourage them, urge them to step up to the plate. Like whenever it's your time, step up to lead a worthy life. So what is a worthy life? It's a, it's a called life. Paul uses this terminology of calling here. To, to walk worthy of the calling which you have been called. Now, this is not just a calling for pastors or, or church staff. And we, we use that terminology a lot, like I was called to be a pastor, right? And well, what do we mean by that? Well, that's, that's God's intention on my life. That's, what he, that's his desire for, for me. But listen, 
Every single believer has been called. Okay? That's what Paul is saying here. If you believe in Jesus, you have been called. If you've been saved, you've been called. What have you been called to do? Well, to live a worthy life, a life of of Christ, a new life in Christ that looks like Christ so that when others hear and see you, they hear and see Jesus in you. That means it's a constant working towards being more like Jesus. This is not just a, well, God did everything in Christ, so I don't have to do anything. You don't find that teaching. You don't find that thought process in anywhere in the Scripture. We don't have the ability to brag about how good we are, but, but we also have to get after it too, to, to live a lifestyle that is worthy of Christ. It's a lifestyle of serving like Jesus served. Uh, hit back in Philippians chapter 2, if you got your Bibles real quick. Philippians chapter 2 gives us a great example of this. Philippians chapter 2, verse. Uh, let's just start in verse 1. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy, Paul says, by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being of full accord of one mind. Now watch this. Jump down to verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count it equality with God to be anything to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. This is the kind of emptying, this is the kind of self-sacrifice. This is the kind of service that, that Paul is talking about. Well, here's what's cool about the Bible. So whenever we jump from Easter, like we took a three-week break, we were looking in the Gospel of John at Jesus and what he said he was and I am statements that he had made, and then we get back into Ephesians, and it's not a different, it's not a different Bible. It's not a different story. It's the same story. We jump into Philippians. It's not a different story. It's, it's the same story. We, you, can, you can go into any book of the Bible, and what you'll find is not that it's a different story, but it's just a different outworking of the same story. Different scenarios, different points, different parts. We're talk- this is all the same stuff. A lifestyle of serving like Jesus served. Listen, if the Lord has called you to salvation, the Lord's also called you to serve. If you're not serving, then, then you're missing out. Now, uh, you've probably had a lot of people that, that have kind of goaded you into serving or like, ah, if we can you know, make them feel guilty or anything like that. But listen, if you truly understand what serving looks like and what it feels like and what it does, then it's, it's a privilege to serve. That's the way that that works its way out. One of my favorite uh, people in, in ministry was a guy named Raymond and uh, I met Raymond when we were in Virginia. And Raymond was our security guard for KidZone. And Raymond was about, uh, was he 80-something? He was, he was north of 85. And an 85-year-old security guard is something to be feared, isn't it? Right? He wasn't ripped and strapped. He wasn't packing or anything like that. He had a, a stool that we had out by the doors. And, and Raymond, he had this, uh, this buzz cut, you know, flat top haircut. Like he, he just, he loved to play golf. And he would, go, he would play golf once a week. And uh, he had two hole-in-ones while I was there. Holes in one, hole-in-ones. I don't know what you call it. But um, it's where you hit the ball one time and it goes in the hole. And I've never done that. And he had two of them. And, uh, and he's just a sweet gentle, humble servant. And, you know, he couldn't do a whole lot of, like, he he couldn't stack chairs, he couldn't, uh, there was a whole lot of physical limitations. But listen, he found a way that he could serve, and he sat there every week, and he welcomed every kid that came into our, into our Kidville. uh, Kidville. A lot of years have passed. Kidville. With a smile, 
and a high five and the heart of a servant. And that was working its way out by living a worthy life. A worthy life is just a life that works out the life that Jesus has worked into us. Let me say that again. A worthy life is just a life that works out the life that Jesus has worked into us. So how do you know if you're leading a worthy life? Well, you probably know. I mean, you, you probably know right now. I mean, like, you, you know, are you leading a worthy life? Uh, that, that, I don't have to really clarify a whole lot about that. But one of the marks of a worthy life is progress. Are, are, if you're leading a worthy life, then, then you're progressing in your faith. You're, you're, getting, you're, you're becoming more of what Paul is, is talking about here. You're becoming more of hum, humility, more of gentleness, more of patience. Man, this, I'm just getting convicted. Anybody else? Like, I, I, I mean, I don't know. Like, this is, this is not stuff that you read and you're like, oh, well, I got that made. That's in the bag right there. Like, that's, I'm good with all that. So progress. All right, second thing, let's go ahead and keep going. Second uh, point is this. We not, only, we not only step up, but we step back. Verse 2 says, be humble and gentle. Our first instincts as, as believers, as Christians, should be towards humility and gentleness. Out of the overflow of our heart. And I'll, I'll give you a scenario to, to know kind of kind of kind of where you're at. All right, so you're playing softball, slow pitch, because that's where most of us are. Right, slow pitch softball. You're down by one, and there's a there's a runner on third base. You've got one person on. You are the winning run, and you step up to the plate. Pitch comes in, and you smack it out into right field. I mean, it, it's a little bit on the outside, and you turn on it. You go ahead and you push it over into right field. It hits the gap. Right fielder is terrible. Like, they, they can't tie their shoes, can't walk, chew gum at the same time, and, and boots the ball to the fence. Well, you're, I mean, you're trucking around first. You're on your way to second. Tying run has already scored. You get headed towards third base, and the third base coach is waving you home. They're still fumbling the ball out in the outfield. Well, by the time you hit third base, you see them pick it up, and the relay throw starts. Relay catches, throws it in. You're humping it, getting it. I mean, you're getting after it, and all of a sudden, you know it's going to be close, but you slide, and you beat it by a good foot. You're there. You jump up, and as you raise your hand, you hear the umpire go, You're out! At that point, you will know whether the first reaction of your heart is humility and gentleness. Anybody with me? Like, listen, sporting events, they cause us to, to know what's in our heart pretty quick. Hey, when you squeeze a lemon, what comes out? When you squeeze your heart, what comes out? What's in it? Whatever's in it, not, not your blood pumping muscle heart, but, but your, your, your inner being, yourself. Like whenever we're squeezed, we really find out what is inside. It's so hard for us to do because in our flesh, most of the time we would rather, rather be right than righteous. You see, as a believer, like I, I'm a pastor, so I'm supposed to look good, right? Supposed to do the right thing. I come sliding across home plate. He calls me out. It's going to be hard for me not to lose my testimony there for a second. <laughs> hey, listen, when this has been one of the things in my life, and, and I'm just going to be real transparent with you. This is going to be one of the things in my life that I have worked for a long time to kill and still have not been able to do it. When we first got married, Sarah and I, we, we could not play games. We could not play board games. Because I would rather be right than righteous. <laughs> and you don't play to have fun. You play to win. And at my house, and when we were living with Sarah's mom and dad for a little while, 
Man, they like to play games. And what do I do most of the time? I don't play. I, I'm not, I, I just don't. And it's not because, it's because there's something that I've been trying to kill in myself that it doesn't look like Jesus. And I'm working on it. And I'm not good at it. So if you got something in your life that you're working at and you're not good at it, but you're still working at it, praise the Lord. You're not done. Keep, keep, keep pressing. Keep stepping back. Keep doing the things that keep you looking more like Jesus than looking more like your old self, right? Man, there's a whole lot in these verses that I had to really wrestle with this week. Step slowly. You know, churches and babies are a whole lot alike. Uh, they're messy. They drop food everywhere. Somebody's always having to clean up after them. There's dirty diapers. They don't necessarily communicate well. They require constant attention. Also, babies and churches can change quickly, right? And sometimes that's hard to keep up with. And without a little patience, actually without a lot of patience, it's, it's easy to get a little, little grit in our crawl, isn't it? If we, don't, if we don't have patience as one of the things that is working its way out in this worthy life that Paul is calling, is urging us to live. Clint Eastwood was uh, playing with Toby Keith. In, a, in the Pebble Beach Pro-Am. And Toby Keith was asking Clint Eastwood, he's like, how do you, at, the, at your age, like most guys are just packing it up, you know. They're not out and about, they're not active, they're not doing what you're doing, like, and they're not, their attitudes are not toward, like your attitude is like, what, what's the secret? And he said, well, he said, every day I get up and I get out. He said, and I determine to not let the old man in Sarah told me that the other day. Not the whole story. I, I researched the whole story because I want to make sure that it was right and it was. And so. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let the old man in. Man, we all need to be, even young men need to be reminded not to let the old man in. And by, I don't mean just males, by the way. This is for all of us. See, we root for babies, right? Whenever a baby falls down because they're trying to walk, we don't go, stupid baby, can't even walk. <laughs> Nobody says that. Why? Because we root for babies, because they're, they're trying, they're growing, they're, they're coming about. But listen, a lot of times we do that with church folks and, and people who claim to be Christians. It's almost like some people sit around waiting for them to screw up so they can go, stupid Christian. See, that wasn't right. You're not real. And so what do we do? We quit trying. What if the first time a baby took a, to try to take a step and fell over and everybody made fun of it and like, stupid baby, like, what are you doing? The baby never learns to walk. Listen, let's, we've got to be patient with each other, with one another. Not just in the church, but in our everyday outworking of every aspect of our life. Anybody, I'm, like patience is just, it, it's hard. It's hard. The J.G. Wentworth motto is our, I mean, that's our theme song, right? It's my money and I want it now. Everything, we got to, but listen, be patient with your, with your church. Be patient with your family. Be patient with your, with your pastor, your staff. Be patient with the process. Like this is, a, this is a basically a new used church. All right? It's not a new church. Like it's been around for a while, over 150 years. But any time that the leadership changes in a church, a new pastor comes, like it's, it's, there's a different, it's, it's a new now. Like it's a, it's a new used church. 
And, and so we're, we're, we're going in that thought process. And with the new used church, a lot of things need updating, need cleaned up, needs a little fixer-upper kind of deal. And then, and then we, we just, we, we got to be patient in that. Because some people are like, man, you're going way too fast. Some people are like, man, you're not going fast enough. Anybody, under, like, you get that same thing with your family, right? We, we can't even, it, it's just hard. Volunteers and scheduling and kids and preschool ministries, responsibilities. And I'm telling you what, uh, Miss Missy Denton has been doing a fantastic job in our preschool, taking care of all of our preschool ministries, and, and she's been working in the office. And, man, that's been a huge, huge deal for us. Uh, man, I just love the, the smile and the bright and the attitude and all that comes with it. And, and she's been doing fantastic work. Has it been all easy in the transition? No. Have things gotten... Uh, absolutely. So whenever something like, like that happens or if there's a, a worker that calls in sick and didn't call in sick, do, do, do we run around like, well, you better get that fixed right now. What, what's wrong with you? What? what, what, what? Brad? They're wanting a keyboard player today. What's wrong with like what? No, that's not what we do. We're patient. Like you only know what you know, and you only see what you see, right? So, so let's continue to to urge each other with patience. We're gonna we're gonna need some patience in the next few months. Um, Brother Donnie, who's been working with our kids for a long time, almost five years now, I think. Um, this just this past week. Uh, has informed us that he has taken a new job as a, as a math, he'll be in the math department at, uh, at Alma, Alma High School. And uh, so next year, they are looking at, at transitioning to Alma. And uh, so what does that mean? Well, it means, means a lot. Number one, it means that we are excited for them. Why? Because we love them. We, we love Donnie and Vanessa. We love their family. We're grateful for what God has done. It, you know, you take a guy that works part-time, and that dude works full-time, part-time, every, every time. And, man, he has done an incredible, incredible job pouring into our kids. And then on the other profession side, He's got an opportunity, so we're excited for him to advance in that opportunity. Flip side of that coin is, man, that just stinks. Hey, I'm, I'm not going. I'll tell you the same thing I told him. I said, dude, I'm excited for you. That stinks. Like I, I, I love it and hate it all at the same time, because because he he means a lot to this this church to these kids. So so in that, what's the timeline? We're not. All, we're still working all that out. He's, he's still planning on being around to the end of school all the way through summertime and, uh, and going to camp. And listen, if you're signed up for kids' camp and student camp, praise the Lord. If you're not, you ought to get to. Like, this is the first time we've actually been able to do camp in a few years, and it's going to be, man, it's going to be awesome. You, you're not going to want to miss it at all. Um, so I, let me encourage you to do that first. But, I mean, like, we're planning on staying all the way through summer. But listen, there's going to be some of you guys that, that you're just going to say, hey, there's a there's going to be some slack to be filled. There's going to need to be some rope that needs to be picked up and pulled. I'm going to have to hold it. There's going to be some of you guys that you're going to need to say, hey, I, I, whatever you need to do in kids' ministry, I'm there to help. Whether it's Wednesday night, whether it's Sunday morning, like whatever you need, listen, until we find somebody to replace them, I'm there. I'm there. I'll, I'll step up. I'll step back. I'll step slowly. I'll step around. That's the last point, step around. So listen, whenever you see Donnie and Vanessa, before I go any further, tell them you're praying for them. Tell them you're grateful to God for the time that they were here. And tell them you're hoping that and praying that one of these days they'll be to come back. Right? I mean, that's, that's the way that, that it ought to work. So encourage them. This is a hard time. Whenever you're, whenever you're making a transition in life, for those of you who've done it, you know it's, it's not an easy thing to do at all. So be praying for them. Number four, step around. 
Paul says maintain unity. Maintain unity. Let me get back to my chapter 4 here. Maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, I was doing, uh, doing some counseling with a dude one time. It wasn't really counseling. It was more like we were, we were talking. But they were having some struggles in their marriage, and, and he was just talking about, like, he said, man, she is never on time. Like, for me, on time means 30 minutes early. And, like, for her, on time means it's time to start, but are we even left the house yet? And he said, I hate being late. I just hate it. With every fiber of my being, I hate being late. And she just doesn't seem to care less about it. And as he went on and on and on, and there were, there were other things other than that, but the lateness, man, he just really kind of honed in on that. And I said, well, man, let me ask you a question. I said, do you love her more than you love being on time? And there was a look that he got in his face that was obvious that he had never, never thought that scenario through before. Because what he was doing was he was seeing through his, his lens only, his perspective only. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to keep unity in the bond of peace. He wanted his way right away. And listen, I'm like that too. And you're like that too. That, that's, that's the outworking of, of the pride that's in us, in our old man, in our old person, our old self, that we want what we want. And it's, it's not a good thing. Listen, we believe that everyone is important. We believe that everyone has a purpose and that everyone is not like you, and we believe that that is a good thing. Everybody's not like me, and that is a good thing. Praise the Lord, that's a good thing. Listen, if we lead with love, if we lead with patience, with humility, with kindness, let me tell you, uh, let me tell you how much I appreciate David Remy. We were, we were discussing a few weeks ago about a piece of property that the church has, and, and uh, there, was a, there was a bid to, uh, somebody had approached us to, to sell that piece of property. It's not a lot. Um, we met and had a, had a church business meeting about it and all, but we were trying to figure out what to do with the money. Um, and it's not, it's not a ton. It's like $6,000. So it wasn't like we were making, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars that we needed to invest. We were just needing to figure out what to do with this. And so... I know that we've got air conditioners that we need to replace on the, on the church property. And so I was like, man, I think we, it'd, it'd be good to just replace the air, use that money to go ahead and front the about $14,000 that we need to replace the air conditioners that need to be replaced because they haven't been maintained well and, and, and we're, we're taking care of all that. But we're on that, like, we just need to get that done. And David, with grace... And humility, he said, Pastor, I, uh, that, that'll work and we'll do whatever you want to do. But he said, have you thought about, like, if, about putting that money on, on the debt retirement? And I said, well, I had, but I think, this, I think I'd rather use it for air conditioners because that's a more immediate need. And he said, well, he said, you, I mean, you're right. He said, but if, we, if it came to, to, to raising, and then we need to, to raise a little bit of money on the, on the side there, it'd probably be easier to raise it for air conditioners than it would be for debt retirement. And you know what I thought? He's right. He's just right. He's righter than I am. And I love, I love that. We all have different gifts, and we see things differently, and we've got different perspectives. Now, what I could have done was said, I could have said, well, let me back up here to, to, uh, to, to chapter 4 and, and let, me, let me just, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, and, and let you know that I have been called to pastor this church. And we will do with that money what, we say, what I say. No. No. That's not, you, you don't use calling as, a, as, a, as the ability to, to, we can never take this and turn it into a weapon. 
Because that's not what it was designed to do. Listen, whenever we see that Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1, if you're taking your calling and you're negating humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, you have neglected your calling. That's how we operate. That's how we should always operate. So when we do have a disagreement, what do we do? Well, we think the best of each other. We guard the unity of the bond of peace of the Spirit. That's what we do. We don't always have to see eye to eye on everything. Some people like a black ceiling. Some people like the way it was. Some people like stained glass. Some people wish we didn't have any. Listen, all that stuff is superfluous. That just means it don't matter. That's a $5 word. I use those just occasionally to make sure that Brother Chester is still staying awake. <laughs> Listen, we live in an imperfect world among imperfect people. We're part of an imperfect church with imperfect believers led by an imperfect pastor and leadership. What could possibly go wrong? Right? That's why we have to guard this. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The great theologian Jack Sparrow famously said this. The problem is not the problem. The problem is your attitude about the problem. Do you understand? I think that's where we hit life a lot. Whatever the problem is, is not necessarily the problem. The problem is our attitude about the problem. And listen, I'll make you a promise right now. I, I will let you down as your pastor. I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good enough. I'm going to let you down. I'm going to mess up. And I, and I worry about that stuff. Miss Anna was, I, I had dropped Cooper off on Friday at school, and I was coming out, and I had Emily with me. She was in for the weekend, and we were going to go to Sweet South and get us one of those sweet strawberry scones. Oh, son, I, if you hadn't had one of those, it'll bless your life. And so I'm at the stop sign right here waiting to pull out, and I'm looking this way, and I'm looking that way. And I'm looking this way, and I'm looking that way, and I got one car that's waiting, and then they signal, and they're about to turn in, and so, all right, I'm clear to go. And about the time that I turn, I catch out of the side of my eye, and I don't realize it, but it's, it's Miss Anna. And she's waving at me, and I can't get my hand up fast enough. And I was like, I, man, I hope she didn't think I was just blowing her off. Because I really didn't see her. And listen, if there's, a, if there's an example of a, of a godly sweet lady that I would never want to do anything to hurt or offend or like, man, she's awesome. And I hope you take it the same way. If, if I ever like, don't wave at you. It's probably because I just wasn't paying attention. Happens a lot. It's not on purpose. It's not intentional. And listen, that's that, that's that unity. That's, that's that attitude. We have to front load our frontal cortex with that, with that attitude of I will be patient. I will be kind. I will guard the unity of our church. Unity in the spirit through the bond of peace. You know what peace doesn't do? It doesn't pick up a stick and go to fight every time. It doesn't attend every fight that it's invited to. I'm going to let you down. Somebody who's a member of this church is probably going to let you down at some point. There's, there's a lot of you that are sitting here that somebody has already let you down long ago. Listen, I, I, man, I just need to, in, in as much grace as I can muster, tell you, like, some of y'all just need to set some stuff down. You need to be like Elsa, let it go. Now, you've been holding on to unforgiveness, and you can't, you can't maintain the unity of the Spirit with a bunch of unforgiveness in your heart. 
You know what unforgiveness is like? It's like drinking a bottle of poison and expecting the other person to die. It doesn't work that way. Your unforgiveness doesn't affect them, it affects you. And it does, that's not to say that what they did was not wrong. It could have been very wrong. But listen, for some of y'all, it's time to let it go. Not for their sake, but for yours. And get on to living, walking in a manner that's worthy of the calling that you've been called. This is a transferable principle. When a believer or a spouse or a family member, a child or a parent messes something up, you make allowance for them because of your love. This is especially true in the church. I've been attending church since nine months before I was born. And I've seen people at their best. And I've seen people say to other people things that I wouldn't say to a dog that I didn't like. And many times what it boiled down to was this. They had expectations of someone that Jesus himself couldn't fulfill. Or they felt wronged. Or they viewed their preferences above others. You know, I was thinking about all the churches that are worshiping today and, and over the past few weeks in the areas and the countries that are surrounding Ukraine that have a bunch of, a bunch of Ukrainian believers that have, that have gotten out of Ukraine and they're now worshiping with people who are not of their native land and not of their native tradition, but of their native gospel. Let me tell you something. If our church was in Poland right now, and I knew that this Sunday there were going to be about 30, 40% of us that were made up of Polish believers, or Ukrainian believers, and we were Polish, me and Brad would get together during the week and we'd say, hey, let's figure out a couple of Ukrainian songs that we can sing. Because the unity of the Spirit matters a whole lot more than my personal preference. And we want to make them feel like this is their home because the kingdom is their home. And that's what we would do. And, and when we don't do that, what we find is all those other things feel wrong, your, your preferences above other people, all, all that stuff is rooted in pride. It says, I want my way more than other people's way. And that is the attitude that is the root of all of these. If you can't be humble, it's because you're prideful. If you can't be gentle, it's because you're prideful. If you can't be patient, it's because you're prideful. If you can't bear with one another in love, it's because you're prideful. If you can't maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, it's because you're prideful. That, that's the root of all of this. But listen, if you'll learn to make allowances for people that you love you'll find yourself with a greater capacity to love people and a lessened need to try to fix them to be like you. That's what pride is. Well, they need to be like this. Well, do they or do you need them to be like that? Well, they should be, well, do, should they? Or do you just think they should be because that's what you would like them to do? Have you ever noticed that we give... Uh, we give ourselves the benefit of grace, but we don't give that benefit to others. Uh, we think the best of ourselves, but we think the worst of others. Isn't that a natural thing for us to do? That's that, that's that old man. So the question that we must ask as we close is, is not how are you doing. The question is who are you being? Not how are you doing, but who are you being? Let's go back to Clint Eastwood. Man, that thought roots itself right here in Scripture in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Let me see if I can find it here. To put off your old self. Word self, you know what the word that they used was? Man. 
to put off your old man, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Don't let the old man in. He'll set up shop. He'll take over. So how do we put off the old man and become who we were made to be? I'm going to give you three things to close. First thing is this. It's going to take time. Time. Not just over time, but time in time. Like, I'm going to have to dedicate time to this. Here's some things that you're going to have to dedicate time to. The Word of God. Reading, studying the Word of God. Prayer. Take time to pray. Take time to get alone, to get quiet, to stop, to be still, to pray, to focus. Time with one another. Somebody who will sharpen iron off of you that will knock some rough edges off of you. I love to be around people that are better than me because they make me better. I get to learn from them. I get to watch them. Man, hang out with somebody. If, if you're new in the faith or if you just need some work, man, find somebody that you think looks a lot more like Jesus than you do and say, hey, would you, would you get together with me and let's, let's do some Bible study? Let's, let's, let's figure this out. Let's, let's, I, man, I've got, some great, I've got some great material. You say, well, I don't know a lot about that kind of stuff. I'll give you something that anybody can do. It's on a four-by-six note card deal, flip, little flip folk. You just meet, you ask questions, you talk about some stuff. It's, it's awesome. Listen, if you're interested in that, we're going to be talking about it a whole lot more and not just talking about it, but we're going to be getting some of those groups together very, very quickly. First thing is time. Second thing is trial. How do you put off the old man and become more of who you were made to be? Trial. Elizabeth Elias, Elliot, the wife of Jim Elliot, says this, God will not protect you from anything that will make you more like Jesus. That's a hard saying, isn't it? But it's true. There's something about the trials of life that refine us to make us look more like Jesus. You going through one right now? Man, let it, let it refine you. Let it bring out the Jesus in you. And the last one is this, time, trial, and intention. Nobody ever got accidentally good at karate. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> I mean, it is true. Like, nobody accidentally ever got good at karate. Why? Because you've got to practice. You've got to rep re repeat, repetition. You've got to learn. You've got to grow. There are steps along the way that, like, you don't just all of a sudden go full-blown matrix and be like, I know karate. It doesn't happen like that. You don't accidentally get good at karate, and you don't accidentally accidentally get good at walking in a manner that's worthy of the calling that you've been called. It takes intention. It takes waking up every day saying, today, I'm not going to let the old man in. I'm going to be patient today. Even if my heart's really not in it. Sometimes i got to let my head do the work and let my heart catch up. You ever had to do that? Like, I'm going to be patient right now because I know it's the right thing to do, but man, I don't feel it. And then later on, you're like, thank you, Lord, for not letting me be an idiot in that situation. And you put somebody in my way that if I had been impatient, I would have squashed something. I would have messed up an opportunity for them to know you better. Man, all, see, all this stuff matters. It matters. Being intentional to walk worthy of your calling in Christ so not how are you doing, but who are you being? Man, that was hard for me. I just kind of figure if it's hard for me, there may be a lot of you guys that struggle with the same stuff. 
It's not major stuff. It's not like we're pillaging and killing people. Like, that's not even in the forefront of my mind. It's not even the back front of my mind. It's really not even in my mind at all. But maintaining unity might be. Being patient and humble. Man, that might be too. So today we're going to spend just a minute. Brad, would you, would you come up here and just, just play your guitar for just a little bit? We're just going to spend just a couple of minutes. This is not necessarily an invitation time for you to come forward or anything like that, but I just want you to bow your heads right now, right over, wherever you are. Just bow your heads, close your eyes, and just get still before the Lord. And if there's something that the Lord was dealing with you about today, some areas that you don't look like who you are in Christ, man, talk to him. Say, Lord, please forgive me for an attitude that doesn't look like you. Forgive my arrogance, my pride, my impatience, my quick tongue. Lord, we need you every day. In our own power, in our flesh, we cannot, we cannot walk at all. Much less walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling that you've called us with. So Lord, I pray that you would change our hearts once again. Open our eyes. And Lord, restore to us the, the joy of salvation, of knowing you. Help us to be intentional. Help us to be patient. Lord, help us to be what you've made us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Guys, we're about to get ready to dismiss. Our ushers are going to be at the back doors and at these side doors, and they're going to be taking tithes and offerings uh, from, our, from our membership. If you're a guest with us today, we would love to get that purple card from you. I've got a gift for you out on the front steps. Love to, love to say hello, uh, meet you. Uh, just thank you for being here today, get to know you a little bit. And uh, man, praise the Lord. Before we leave, we're going to pray uh, really quickly. Miss Grace Widener is going to have a pacemaker put in on Wednesday. And uh, so we're, let's just stop and pray for grace right now that that, that, that would go, go well. Lord, we, we trust you in all things. Lord, we're, we're grateful that, uh, that the doctors have figured out uh, what they need to do here with this pacemaker. So, Lord, as they've got this scheduled uh, for Wednesday, I pray that it would be successful, that everything would go smoothly, uh, that there would be a, a good recovery, Lord, and that this would help her heart uh, to function like it needs to function. Uh, Lord, we're grateful for their family. Pray that you would bless them indeed. In Jesus' name, amen.